Hey guys, long time no see. Welcome back to another video. So nowadays, there are countless ways to build a website. You can spin up an Apache web server and serve HTML and PHP files. You can use a templating system like Go's templating system or Django's templating system. Or you can have your website render inside the browser using a client-side framework like React, Angular, or Vue, and just serve a single JavaScript file. And the list goes on from there. But today I want to share with you one more way of building a website and that is building a website using Rust and WebAssembly. Specifically, I'll be showing you how I rewrote my old personal website using WebAssembly. So initially, I wrote my website using React because I wanted to learn React at the time. But ever since learning React, I've also been exploring alternatives to it, such as Svelte and WebAssembly. Not because I don't like React, I just want to see what other tools are available to me. When I tried Svelte, I was having trouble with HTML bookmarks, and I couldn't get it to work with their routing system for some reason. So I ended up not using it for my website. But this time with WebAssembly, I actually got something working that I'm genuinely happy with, and it'll be replacing my old React website moving forward. Meow. 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 And if you wanna check them out, I have links to both of them in the video description. So in this video, I'll be going over what I used to build my website, some code examples, my thoughts on the tools, and whether you should use WebAssembly for your next website. Okay, so I guess before getting started, we should take a look at what my website looks like. So here's the front page of my website, and we have some links to my GitHub, my LinkedIn, YouTube, my email, and my resume, and then two other links for my experiences and my projects. So if we go into experiences, we'll show It'll show where I worked at and some extracurricular stuff I've done. And if we go into projects, we'll also see the projects I've done on GitHub and some contributions I've made. Over here, we have some HTML bookmarks where we can click and it will move us over to that specific section. And if we click on a specific project, it'll show us the stars we have on GitHub and the number of forks it has. And we can also check out the GitHub by pressing the GitHub icon. And here I wrote a little bit on why I made this project and the things I've learned. We also have a back button to go back. So yeah, that's pretty much it for my project. It's pretty simple. The hardest part was probably fetching the GitHub stats using their API and then dynamically changing the numbers on my website. So to build my website, I used this library called U and it describes itself as a modern Rust framework for creating multi-threaded front-end web applications with WebAssembly. And what you'll find is that it's very similar to React's component system. It features a JSX-like syntax, it has a virtual DOM, and it's interoperable with JavaScript. And this kind of sucks because I really enjoyed React's hook system, so going back to a class-like structure wasn't very fun. The whole thing took me about four to five days to finish. It was a pretty close one-to-one -one mapping between the React website and the WebAssembly website. I basically reused all my component logic and everything else was pretty straightforward. And since it's a personal website, most of the data is static. The only problem I ran into was how arrays worked in JavaScript and Rust. In JavaScript, global arrays can be mutable. So I had an array of projects and whenever I fetched the GitHub metrics for that specific project, I would add those metrics to the project's attributes so I don't need to refetch them later on. This is to reduce the amount of API calls my website makes because GitHub has a limit on their API calls. In Rust, however, global arrays are static, meaning they're immutable. So I couldn't use the same technique. So I ended up creating a global hash map that maps the username slash repo name to their GitHub metrics. Now let's take a look at some of the code that I wrote. So first we have the librs file. This is the entry point for our web application. It's what's going to be exported to JavaScript and then JavaScript's going to be able to call our function to start our web application. Inside our lib.rs file, you can see that we have our recursion limit set to 640. So Rust doesn't complain about recursion limit reach. Next, we import our app router, which is what I implemented for our routing. Next, we have our struct model, which is what our component is called. We have our create method that creates our component and it basically acts as a constructor. Then we have two more functions called update and change. And this is like the lifecycle methods you have in React, where when something changes or updates, it would call these methods and depending on whether these return true or false, it would re-render the component. 
And finally, we have our view method. And this is basically the same as a render method in React, where it returns some JSX to render to the screen. Next, let's take a look at our app router.rs. Inside here, we have our app router component, and pretty much most of the code is inside our view method. We can see that depending on what the route is, we load up different components and we pass in different props. And then at the very end, we have JSX to render out our component. Now let's take a look at a more complicated component. Here we have the project header component, which is common to all projects. So the first thing we have is an enum called fetch state. This is what I use to determine what the state of our component is in. And we have a never, which we never fetched for any GitHub metrics. An error in which something happened. Fetching, which is we're currently fetching, but we haven't gotten a response back from the API. And success, in which case we got our GitHub metrics. Next, we have our prop, and this is what our component will be taking in. It will just be taking in a project. And finally, we have our project header, which has the props, the fetch state, and also the link. The link is what we use to have callbacks for our component when something changes. So here we have our create method again, where we create our component. And then in our update method, we would set our fetch state to the message. And if the message was success, then we would add the GitHub metrics to our global hash map. Finally, in our view method, we have an if statement that checks if we've never fetched our GitHub metrics yet. And if we haven't, then we first consult our hash map and see if there's already metrics for this specific project. And if there is, then we would just use those GitHub metrics for our component. And if there isn't, then we call a fetch function that get the GitHub metrics for the specific project. And then once we're done fetching, we have a callback function that sets our fetch state to that specific message. Finally, we have our JSX where we render out the project header with the metrics. And this function is just the function I use to fetch GitHub APIs using JavaScript APIs. As you can see, it's kind of ugly, but hey, at least it works. My thoughts on you so far is that the project is coming along pretty well, and it might even be a contender to React in the future. But right now it has some minor quirks. I don't really like how it's following React's component system rather than React hook system. Their fetching system is also a little bit hard to use. I ended up just using JavaScript's fetching system, but with Rust. Their JSX language makes use of Rust macro system, but Rust macro system has a really low recursion limit. So then you might run into issues where it says maximum depth reached, in which case you have to increase the recursion limit for Rust. And I also saw some inconsistencies with their class attributes. In React, all their components have a class name attribute to specify which class this component is a part of. But in U, some components wouldn't have the class tag or they would have it renamed as classes. So that's something that I want to see fixed as well. So what are some of the advantages and disadvantages for using WebAssembly? And should you use it for your next website? So let's talk about the disadvantages first. First of all, there's a lot of boilerplate code you have to write. Rust being a statically typed language, you have to specify all the types. And in addition to that, for each class, you have to specify which props it can take in and which messages it can pass. And because the language is statically typed and it's not garbage collected, it's a lot more picky than JavaScript, which is dynamically typed and garbage collected. On top of that, only recent releases of web browsers support WebAssembly, so legacy systems won't be able to access your website. And as of right now, the WebAssembly ecosystem isn't as mature compared to the Node.js and React ecosystem. But there are some advantages to it too. It's a really cool piece of technology that's going to be used much more in the future, so getting yourself familiar with it now could be useful in the future. There are also some performance benefits to it. My WebAssembly website is about half the size of my React website, but this also depends on the language you're using. For example, if you were to write WebAssembly in Go, it would be a lot bigger because they have a runtime and everything. But I also heard the Go team is working really hard to optimize that away, so that might not be the case in the future. And lastly, it's just really cool. Not many people can say they wrote their website using WebAssembly. So in conclusion, do I recommend you write your website using WebAssembly? Probably not for an entire website like what I did. There's just too much boilerplate code to write to get anything substantial working. At least for the U library, you have to explicitly state all the messages and props a component can take in. The tooling for it is still not as feature rich as React and Node. But if you want to use WebAssembly for a small portion of your website to speed things up, or if you're building a really big single page application like Google Maps or Google Docs, then you might want to look into WebAssembly. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I was able to make this video because it's reading week now, so have the whole week to catch up on all my studies. 
and make some videos. Like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next video.